In Greek mythology, the goddess Athena is the daughter of Zeus who was produced without a mother. In other versions, she came to be when Zeus swallowed his wife Metis, the goddess of counsel, while she was pregnant. Metis, who, according to prophecy, was to bear a son so strong he would overthrow Zeus himself. In both versions, Athena bursts from the head of Zeus fully grown and in armor. She is the goddess of wisdom and war, particularly strategic warfare. What's interesting about this is the father-daughter dynamic that ensues. In mythology, Athena is Zeus's favorite child, and she is fiercely loyal to him, and she aligns herself with the male ideal and patriarchy. In fact, she says, There is no mother anywhere who gave me birth, and, but for marriage, I am always for the male, with all my heart and strongly on my father's side. In Game of Thrones, Cersei Lannister has a love-hate relationship with her father. On one hand, she respects him and is loyal to the name and her house, but on the other hand, she despises him for not truly seeing her. Cersei believes that if she were born a man, her father would have loved her more and given her more opportunities. She is incredibly bitter because of this, but she has no interest in changing the system. In fact, she desperately wants to be a part of it. She spews her anger on more vulnerable women and in turn actively perpetuates the same misogyny that she wants to be rid of. Nevertheless, her feelings of inferiority because of her gender were greatly affected by her father, Tywin Lannister. Tywin despises weakness. In a storm of sores, Tywin's brother, Kevin Lannister, describes him by saying, Tywin seems a hard man to you, but he's no harder than he's had to be. Our own father was gentle and amiable, but so weak his bannermen mocked him in their cups. Some saw fit to defy him openly. Other lords borrowed his gold and never troubled to repay it. At court, they japed toothless lions, even his own mistress stole from him. A woman scarcely one step above a whore, and she helped herself to my mother's jewels. It fell to Tywin to restore House Lannister to its proper place, just as it fell to him to rule this realm when he was no more than twenty. He bore that heavy burden for twenty years, and all it earned him was a mad king's envy. Instead of the honor he deserved, he was made to suffer slight beyond count. Yet he gave the Seven Kingdoms peace, plenty, and justice. He's a just man. Tywin's hatred of weakness clearly stems from his own father. In a society where femininity and weakness are basically synonymous, it's no wonder his sexist attitudes bled into his treatment of Cersei and tainted her own view of herself. You're still here. Yes. Why? Did it ever occur to you that I might be the one who deserves your confidence and your trust? Not your sons, not Jamie or Tyrion, but me. Years and years of lectures on family and legacy. <laughs> the same lecture, really, just with tiny, tedious variations. Did it ever occur to you that your daughter might be the only one listening to them, living by them? That she might have the most to contribute to your legacy that you love so much more than your actual children? All right. Contribute. The Tyrells are a problem. The Tyrells helped us defeat Stannis Baratheon. The Tyrells saved your life, your children's lives. Marjorie has her claws in Joffrey. She knows how to manipulate him. Good. I wish you knew how to manipulate him. I don't distrust you because you're a woman. I distrust you because you're not as smart as you think you are. Cersei wants to be Tywin's heir, but he does not think that she is fit for it. While Cersei is strategic and cunning, she has also proven to be rash and unable to take criticism. In Avatar The Last Airbender, Azula is a child prodigy gifted in both strategy and combat. She is the younger sister of Zuko and daughter of Firelord Ozai and Ursa. She respects Ozai and looks up to him. She is his favorite child. 
Azula has a very strange relationship with her mother, Ursa, who communicated more easily with her brother, so naturally she went to the parent that praised her abilities. She absorbs many of the flaws of her father. She thinks that power needs to be garnered by making others fear you, and thinks anything less than perfection makes her useless, as Ozai will not accept anything but perfection. Azula is incredibly smart and manipulative. At the age of 14, she successfully managed a coup in Ba Sing Se, the last stronghold left in the Earth Kingdom, and also halted the invasion of the Black Sun. Unlike Cersei, Azula doesn't dislike being a girl as it has never hindered her from her goals. What Azula has is a fear of abandonment, which most likely stemmed from her relationship with her mother. So when she gets betrayed by her friends Mei and Tai Li, it sets off a series of unfortunate events. One of the first and only times we see Azula being emotionally manipulated is by her father, Ozai. Ozai goes back on a promise and tries to convince Azula that she's better off staying where she is. In this scene, we really see that she's still just a child, regardless of the tough exterior she puts on. She tells Ozai not to treat her like Zuko, her brother who he abuses both physically and emotionally, and views as useless. He then gives her the title of Fire Lord, then puts himself at an even higher category, rendering it useless. Jibroy is a smart and competent former political consultant. She's also the daughter of billionaire businessman Logan Roy, who is the head of the American conglomerate Waystar Royco. Shiv, like Cersei, thinks she's smarter than she is. This coupled with her lack of introspection are some of her major flaws. In the show, Shiv competes with her two brothers, Roman and Kendall, to be the successor of their father. Her siblings are equally power-hungry with a broken moral compass that is definitely in part to emulating their father. Shiv has proven to be the most strategic and possibly the smartest of the Roy kids. In the show, Shiv positions herself as a feminist, but we quickly learn that she serves only herself, not any ideology. In the 2019 Vulture article by Jen Cheney titled, Shiv is exactly who you think she is, Cheney writes, It's tempting to think of Succession's Shiv Roy as someone worth rooting for, if only because the people around her so clearly aren't. Her father has no moral compass, her brothers are, respectively, an addict, a slime ball, and a nincompoop. Her husband, as evidenced by his testimony before Congress in this week's episode DC, has as much spine as your average sidewalk slug. The fact that Shiv is competent, astute, and frank about her ambitions, on top of that, a woman who has to deal with all these ridiculous men, makes her one of the few succession characters that you're almost, almost tempted to admire. But as Succession heads into its season 2 finale, DC reminded us that we definitely should not admire Shiv or want to be anything like her. So, here's how I see it. Come in. Six months with Jerry, six months with Carl, Hong Kong for, say, another 12, uh, Berlin or London, uh, management training program for six. Come back, spend 12 months alongside me, and when you're ready, I'll step aside. Wow, Dad, that's a lot of months. It's an appropriate amount of months. Also, management training program? Roman COO, you have a toddler with a heart on for chief operating officer, and I'm going through a management training program? You're a young woman with no experience. A woman, that, that's a minus. Well, of course it's a fucking minus. I didn't make the world. You make a small part of it. If that doesn't work for you, what does? Shiv's biggest hindrance from getting what she wants to take over Waystar Raiko is her lack of experience coupled with her being a woman. Her being a young woman is seen as both an asset when it serves her father optically and an issue when it does not. The birth of Athena completed the evolution from a mother-dominated mythology to one dominated by a supreme patriarch, Zeus. Through two generations, mothers had controlled the power structure of the immortals. In league with their sons, these mothers had toppled their mates. First, Gaia had conspired with her son Cronus to castrate Uranus. Next, Rhea, with Gaia's help, had saved her son Zeus in order to overthrow Cronus. Zeus ended this pattern, however, by swallowing Matus and the unborn Athena. In appropriating the female function of giving birth, Zeus ended the line of female supremacy. For Athena, born out of Zeus's head, owed no loyalty to any mother. Among all the other traits these women share, one is the absence of a maternal figure. 
Cersei's mother passed away giving birth to her brother. Azula's mother was banished and Shiv's mother left after divorcing her father. This absence of the mother or any strong maternal figure led them to solely rely on their narcissistic fathers. Azula's relationship with her mother Ursa is very complicated. After Ozai attempted to usurp his brother Iroh's birthright because he lost motivation to continue to fight after the death of his son, Azula thought a suitable punishment would be for Ozai to kill his own son so he would know what it feels like to lose one. Ozai had no problem doing this, so in order to prevent Zuko from being murdered, Ursa made a deal with him, saying that she would make a poison to kill Azula so Zuko's life could be spared, and Ozai could become Fire Lord instead. He agreed on the condition that she left and never showed her face in the Fire Nation again, as he feared that she would also try to poison him one day. Ursa wanted to bring her children with her, but Ozai refused. Azula never had a real connection with Ursa. She fit into the mold of the Fire Lord's ideals, so she was never in any real physical danger like her brother Zuko, who was an outcast, was. Ursa had to protect him from his father and grandfather. She would criticize Azula's rude remarks, all the while cuddling Zuko, leading Azula as a young kid to believe that she hated and was afraid of her. And we see throughout the show that this reaction to Azula, though unintentional, was very damaging to her emotional development. And after her mother left, it only further pushed her towards getting the approval of her father that she did not get from her mother. Cersei's mother, Joanna Lannister, died while giving birth to her brother Tyrion. She was only four years old at the time. Cersei rarely mentions her mother except when taunting Tyrion and blaming him for her mother's death. This is also something her father does. Shiv has a strained relationship with her mother, Lady Carolyn Collingwood, as she and her siblings all chose their father over her. Their mother still resents them for this and brings it up frequently. After divorcing Carolyn, her father married Marcia, who Shiv distrusts and has no real bond with. I'll start if you like. Yeah, please. Um, everything I've done in my life, I've done for my children. I, I know I've made mistakes, but um, but I've always tried to do the best by them because they mean everything to me. Okay. That was great. Uh, thank you. Well, that's nice. Mm, it is nice. Yeah, sure. No, agreed. So what do we feel about what we just heard here? I mean, I hear it. I hear it. Uh-huh. Big words. Good words. Oh, I'm still processing, but yeah. Narcissistic fathers often emotionally damage their children. They disregard boundaries, manipulate their children by withholding affection, and neglect to meet the needs of their children because they're interested only in meeting their own needs. Their image and perfection is essential to narcissists. They often demand perfection from their children. The children thus feel intense pressure to be perfect and try to ramp up their talents, looks, intellect, or personality to please their father. It has a high personal cost to them if they succeed in fulfilling their father's wishes, and it can cost them just as much if they fail. It's a no-win situation. Logan Roy is a force of nature who commands respect wherever he goes. He is cold, angry, and calculated, and always seems to come out on top. He doesn't operate from a space of ethics or morals. His only guiding principle seems to be profit. He is emotionally abusive as he toys with the feelings of others to get what he wants, and actively disposes of them when they no longer serve his purpose. Logan values cunning, ruthlessness, and ambition. As he says, you have to be a killer. It's no wonder then why his children adopt these values as the blueprint to get the power and approval from him that they crave. Logan is of course aware of this dynamic and uses it to get his way. In the show, there are multiple comparisons between Logan and Zeus. Logan always seems to be the most powerful person in the room and he likes it that way. The show implies that Logan had a rough and possibly traumatic childhood, though it is never explicitly stated. Ozai is the most powerful man in the Avatar universe, both with his title and through his abilities. He is a dictator who rules with an iron fist. 
He is spiteful and unforgiving and cares more about his titles and accomplishments than his own family. He is abusive and controlling and manipulates the people in his life to get what he wants. Tywin was known as the most powerful person in Westeros, despite him never actually being a king. He was strategic, manipulative, and ruthless, and like the others, intelligent and calculated. But in the end, their narcissism and mistreatment of their own children leads to their own demise. The great gift Athena can give modern woman is the realization that creation and action are as inherently natural to a woman as to a man. But many women abuse this gift and suffer for it. They become so enthralled with keeping up with the men that they ignore their feminine attributes. These women embrace the masculine part of Athena. Their passion for work and intellect turns into coldness, aloofness, self-righteousness. Some fear their emotions. None are willing to search their hearts for dreams, feelings, or satisfaction. These modern Athenas want to control their own lives and everyone who becomes a part of it. Modern women would do well to re-examine the person of Athena. Although her life was full of accomplishment, she could not elevate the status of woman. She gave Athenians a city to be proud of and liberty for all citizens, but did not create a society in which women shared equal treatment with men. Athena, daughter of the king of gods and wisdom itself, had every opportunity for an accomplished, fulfilling life, but she chose to devote herself to the world of men and rejected the opportunity to become champion of the Greek women. The Athenas are greatly influenced by a powerful patriarch. They know how to play the game, but they are rarely given a chance to dominate it. They are loyal to the patriarch and, by extension, the patriarchy, a system that is not loyal to them. Although they are victims of misogyny, their proximity to power and wealth shields them from it more than the average woman. Just like their fathers, they are cruel and cunning and thinks the world revolves around them, but the world is way less forgiving to disagreeable women. Can't wait for this to be